get people to think. I mean, something new is happening there. I, I find incomprehensible from the standpoint of my so-called old left, or even new left experiences. It requires a knowledge of the history of the left. We have to know that. And I'm trying to somehow furnish that with a book coming out, possibly early next year, the first volume of which will be called The Third Revolution. People have to know what the left was, and I've written a piece, and it's going to be part of a series of essays that AK Press is going to publish out of San Francisco. And that essay, particularly, that I commend to people is the left that was, not the left that pretends to be left today, which is really a form of liberalism, or worse, postmodernism. It's hard to say which is worse in any case. So I feel that that kind of development has to take place. A process of recovering, reevaluating, and advancing ideas and theories. Anyone who's anti-theoretical, in my opinion, is useless. Such people should throw bricks and then go home. And if possible, watch themselves on TV. I saw that in the 60s. But they're not necessary to any movement of the kind that I'm talking about. They're having kicks. Temporary autonomous zones. For a moment they're free by throwing a brick. Then after they're repressed when they get clobbered over the head by the police. So you know you go from one to another. Capitalism can live with that. I've seen capitalism with much, live with much worse than that. So theory. Development of rationality. Understanding the history. Developing a programmatic perspective. I dislike anti-institutional, anti-programmatic so-called leftists. Because without institutions, you have no society. You're going to have them anyway. The question is whether they're going to be emancipatory institutions or whether they're going to be domineering institutions. And that involves, in my opinion, participatory democracy that has to be institutionalized. And the program. And we have to recognize that there are some people who know more than other people. Otherwise, we carry on a dirty trick. It's called the tyranny of structurelessness, <laughs> which I saw magnificently enacted in the Clamshell Alliance in the 1970s, when in the name of no structure, in the name of consensual consensus-making decisions, a small little mafia group, I use the word mafia as a metaphor here, went ahead and manipulated the Clamshell Alliance into its own self-destruction, using very naive people, in the name of an egalitarianism that was phony to begin with. As I pointed out, I'm not equal to you now at the age of 70, approaching 74, because I can't run anymore. <laughs> I can hardly walk. I need your help, and you've been kind enough in doing all kinds of little things before we got started and while we've been talking today. And I depend upon the kindness of people. <laughs> So I prefer the kindness, not the myth, that I don't depend upon it. And I'm not differently abled, I'm terribly disabled. Differently abled implies that we're merely talking about differences, not about the fact that I can't move. You know what I mean? Comfortably, at least, and function. And I can't chew. I have no teeth. Now what about that? Am I merely differently abled, or am I disabled? And if we're going to have a truly communist society with a small c, is it not necessary for people to help me? To help me get up, to help me move, transport me in a vehicle. Okay? Whereas before, I could do that on my own. And as a baby, I couldn't do it at all either, you know? So this mythology of, of a phony egalitarianism escapes the need to compensate for the inequalities. What you do is you preserve them. <laughs> and you simply put a different name on them, calling them differently able. Though I think it's very important to recognize we need an ethics of complementarity. That must be part of our left. And we have to be able to encompass, which the old left did not do well, if at all at times. We have to encompass, encompass the requirements, the necessities that fulfill the potentialities, the circumstances that fulfill the potentialities achieve those changes that fulfill the potentialities of women, of oppressed peoples, peoples of color, people in the third world, as well as people who are homeless in the first world and who are oppressed in the first world and who are filling as prison populations. 
we have to inco include these problems on a broader and richer scale, and certainly in a more imaginative scale. But imagination to power without reason means to empower an imagination that can go in any direction. So we have to defend that rationality more than ever before with our own history as well as the history of humanity generally, namely the history of the left and what is to be learned from that. What are we to learn from the Spanish Revolution of 1930s? What are we going to learn from the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917? You know, people haven't learned the lessons of that revolution yet. They haven't learned the lessons of that revolution yet. And we're talking of a revolution 70 years ago. They haven't learned that. Not to speak of the Paris Commune, and not to speak of 1848, and not to speak of the labor movement and not to speak of the French, American, and English revolutions, what they have to teach us, what their message was, what we can learn from them. We have no such history, really, together today. It exists in fragments, pieces, a volume on this particular revolution or a volume on that particular event and whatever you like. We have to do that. We have to hold up the principle of hope, not the principle of personal retreat into a free, temporary, autonomous zone. You mean my autonomous zone? I don't like the word autonomy very much. I like the word freedom. Autonomy bespeaks of the petty bourgeois' right to smoke pot, drop acid, do whatever the hell he or she wants, you know what I mean? That's fine. I don't care. You want to do it, do it. You're only doing it to yourself, but you're not doing anything that is really social. I prefer freedom, in which autonomy rests on the kind of social structure you are building. And I saw that when I traveled through Spain in 1967 when Franco was still alive. I went into second-class trains and sat together. I deliberately eschewed the use of first-class trains, which I could have had for nothing in as much as I had a Eurail pass. So instead of sitting in these air-conditioned uh, first-class trains, I deliberately, when I traveled through Spain in 1967 for weeks, went into second-class trains to talk to Spanish people. And these Spanish people came out of a rich community, but yet each one, despite the enormous sense of community that existed in the Spanish towns, the pueblos, the intense sense of mutual responsibility and mutual aid, which was not just born out of anarchist theory, it was born out of the whole tradition of Spain, yet came out as deeply etched, rich individuals, everyone unique, a unique but a unique that was a product of the collective, because it had the support of the collective behind its uniqueness. So the word autonomy leaves me cold, and I prefer much more the word freedom, because that would embrace that sense of collectivity, not the auto, which in ancient Greek, and I assume today in modern Greek, means self. The word auto means the self. Now, I, I'm not into that kind of individualistic so-called anarchism that really can also lead into anarcho-capitalism without any difficulty. Now, these are the elements, I believe, that the left has to organize as well, bring together into a coherent, always challengeable, highly democratic, political in the sense that I, I don't mean the state, but I mean the community, the polis, political program, as well as practice. These are absolutely necessary in my view if there is going to be a left, and I'm not much concerned at the age approaching 74, I'm not much concerned of whether or not I'm going to see it tomorrow. I am not accustomed to the fast food form of radicalism, you know. Well, if I can't get it tomorrow, you know, I do what Jerry Rubin does, become a stockbroker. Such people, in my opinion, are pathetic. And that is not the material out of which, the human substance out of which a real left can be born. We have to seek a left as well from a personal standpoint, since the personal seems to be everything today, even from a personal standpoint, insofar as we want to retain our integrity. If we do not oppose the society, and in my opinion, on the bases that I've tried to establish, on reason, history, civilization, taking in new social questions, maintaining a great tradition, elaborating it, discarding what is lifeless in it, maintaining coherence, maintaining rationality, maintaining hope, then we will be destroyed as individuals. 
we will become consumers or we'll become psychopaths or we'll become autonomous in the privatistic sense, you know what I mean, that I must, like the Romans under the uh, empire, you know, I have my liberty but the hell with everything else. Or because I can, uh, you know, go manic, I'm damaging the society. In the meantime, I'm being photographed by an endless number of fashion designers to see what I wear, whether I look like O.J. Simpson, you know what I mean, what I buy, and what my lifestyle is. Now, that kind of lifestyle type of leftism is, in my opinion, got nothing to do with the left. That doesn't mean that one lives a conventional lifestyle. That doesn't mean that one shouldn't be free to exercise imagination, to engage in hallucination and hallucinations if one wants to. I, for one, don't want to. I would urge people not to, because we are now pervaded by a universal mysticism that is very, very frightening. People are calling up astrologers on 900 numbers, and they're being advertised everywhere. And they will tell you, these psychics and astrologers, what your future is going to be. If you look into much of the material that they give you, like in the I Ching, they tell you every argument in the world, so they can't go wrong. It's going to be a good, unhappy day for you, in which you're going to be very merry but sad. And you're going to have wonderful memories, but at the same time, they're going to be... So therefore, and therefore, take a shower, and do whatever you like. Well, it's going to be a momentous day for you, even if nothing happens, because you'll see the consequences of it ten years from now. That's the priestly method, by the way, that has been used for thousands of years, <laughs> you know what I mean, to make a prediction that, uh, on which you can't lose, you see. And I did that by reading, I found out about that by reading the I Ching from beginning to end. No, we have to free ourselves from these superstitions if we're going to have a world. We have to not disenchant, in a certain sense, but in a sense, give meaning. Far more important than enchantment is to give meaning to our lives. And part of the meaning of our lives is to be rational, to fulfill what is most basic in our potentialities, the ability to think, and to think beyond the given, to think away from the given, to think in opposition to what is the thoughtless, the mindless, the irrational. And whether we have our revolution or fast food tomorrow, or we never live to see it, We'll be doing no differently than what great revolutionaries, unknown to us by name, have done for 200 and 300 years. They fought for a reason, and in fighting for reason, they were, in a sense, not immediately, but indirectly fighting for their own integrity. That's what made them, in the best of cases, true leftists. Not the synthetic stuff we have today, which is purely privatistic. So that, those are, put all of these ideas together, if I may, the history, the civilization, the rationality, the technology, the right to intervene, because we are constructed by our natural evolution to intervene in the world, the great maxim that even Marx so well put, I shouldn't even say even Marx, Marx was no peanut, and the famous 11th Thesis on Feuerbach, up to now, philosophers have been thinking about the world. The time has come to change it. We are made to change. Otherwise, we're not human. We fall back onto the basic primate level, which is what many people want to push us back to. Capitalism, however, is very active. It intervenes everywhere. It uses its own instrumental reason to manipulate us. It is well organized. In the meantime, it permits its academics and its disenchanted leftists and it's lumpen left, and I think some of these people can recognize whom I'm talking about, to give us babble about temporary autonomous zones or anti-technologism or irrationalism or spirit, spirit, not spirituality so much, because spirituality